Okay, so recording is on. Um, welcome everyone. Um, this is, uh, I think this is the fourth, um, it is the fourth Ask Me as a, as, as a Kanban Trainer session that we're running. Um, it's a joint event between um, ProKanban.org, the community um, meetup group, and Lina Jan London meetup group. Um, so it's the uh, first time that we're doing this in um, more or less, I mean, usually we do this in European time zones. Today we are doing it um, in American time zone. And part of the reason is because we have the absolute privilege to have Todd with us. Um, so Todd, say hello. Hi. You Hi. How's everybody doing? <laughs> yeah. That's it. Happy to be here <laughs> so, with Jose. Yeah. And we're going to have a, hopefully we have an hour, good session, Q&A. Um, so we can we can obviously explore things that you as a community, we have your, your questions, your thoughts, your challenges, things that you'd like to share about Kanban. Normal format is please type on chat questions that you have. Um, I will be trying to monitor it. If they're hard, that's great. Todd is here, he can answer them. If they're easy, I might answer them. Um, but I will be monitoring the, uh, what questions there are there, and I will be hopefully inviting you to ask the questions on, on audio, make it a conversation. Don't, don't, don't just like a flat Q&A. So we will try to make it a conversation and an exploration. And if you're happy with that, yeah, please, um, you can start typing questions um, and we'll be keeping an eye. While you have a chance to ask questions, um, let, let's, let's, you know, Todd, like just a quick one. I mean, do you, what what's it about for you for Kanban? You know, what's you? I know you. I know you. I knew you initially is like a Scrum trainer. Yeah. PSK trainer, so Scrum with Kanban trainer. Now Pro Kanban trainer and so on. What's it about Kanban that that, that makes you go? Ooh, interesting. Yeah. Well, uh, it's interesting because even before I found Scrum, uh, I was working in a XP shop, extreme programming. So that my roots are in really there. And uh, mm -hmm. as uh, as a developer, and and working through that, we 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 were always trying to find the best ways of working on our own, right? Uh, I was lucky enough to work in one particular place that that uh, management was really um, would just let us go because we were doing a good job. And the, the what struck me about Kanban and working with a Scrum team, maybe this it's going to date me, Jose, but this is like ten years ago. <laughs> yeah. But what, what, we, what we kept discussing over and over and over again in a sprint retrospective was that it felt like we would do sprint planning and then everybody would go in a different direction. Everybody would start working in a different direction. And no matter what promises we made and retrospective commitments that we were bringing forward, it just didn't seem to change. It seemed like the pressure took over and it didn't change for us. Um, and then we did something magical. Jose, we uh, we started using whip limits. Uh huh. Right. Mm -hmm. We started using we 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 uh, we took a chance and said during a retrospective that uh, the next sprint we're going to limit our whip, and we're going to see what happens. And we started looking more intently at uh, CFDs and mm -hmm. understanding how uh, how things were happening. Uh, work in progress. Work is, a whip is work in progress, and. Uh, wouldn't you know that we were getting more work done? We felt like a much better team and uh, 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 the product was better. All, all as a, a result of this, this little tweak. And this is inside of Scrum, right? And ever since then, I've, I've really been a student of Kanban, uh, both independently and with Scrum. And uh, yeah, so I guess that's, that's my story. Yeah. And it, it is interesting, I mean, what you said there, because um, sometimes in in the community we felt, I mean, even today I had this question, like, um, what about this thing about, like, having to choose between Scrum and Kanban? Hmm. And, and and as you say, like, the, 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 you know, if you if you are at team level and you're working on the on, on, on any of these environments, they actually have, you know, they're very similar. They're almost like, I, I, the, the Venn diagram is, is huge. So the compatibility is there. It's very, very, very good. Yeah. Um, so yeah, good, good, good. Um, I am looking at some questions. Uh, let's just start here. Um, so there is a question, okay, straight away, which is gonna be easy. Is there a Slack community for people who want to get involved with Pro Kanban? Well, look at the chat because I just put it, the link 
to the Pro Kanban Slack community. Um, there is some questions for people, hey, how do I become a, a, a Kanban trainer with Pro Kanban? In the Slack community, there is a channel where you can do um, trainer inquiries. So um, go to the Slack channel, find the trainer inquiries um, channel, and over there, we you, you can find out there is some pin documents, um, pin, pin messages that can tell you, hey, you want to become a trainer, this is how you do it. Cool? Hopefully. So, uh, okay, there was a question here about, let me just find out. Um, Tom Callaway, would you like to ask your question? Would you like to ask your question yourself about um, tools? Uh, sure. Uh, I had just been evaluating, uh, hi everybody, uh, some various tools uh, from Trello, like common ones to others for Kanban boards. And I don't see with limits very often. Uh, I think I saw it in Jira and, and Azure. But uh, yeah, I'm curious if there are any other tools. Uh, I think Kanbanize, I saw that. Uh, mm -hmm. If you have any other tools that uh, enforce or defining with limits, I'd be curious to know. Mm -hmm. Which one do you use? Have you used any in particular at the moment on? Uh, well, I've used Trello, uh, Zen Hub, uh, mm -hmm. other things like that, but I've been mm -hmm. kind of evaluating them from a Kanban perspective. And that's why I was interested in the whip limits. Cool. Todd, what's your... Your yeah, so anyway? from a Trello perspective, I believe Tre Trello, there's some power ups that you can add to Trello that will allow you to enable whip limits. Um, other than that, um, so uh, it's slight tool rant. I'm fairly tool agnostic. I, uh, the one thing that I feel about tools is that tools tend to dictate your process rather than you being able to dictate your process to tools. Um, Saying that I like any tools that I can mesh my raw data with and get what I'm looking for out of it. Um, but I will plug anything that's compatible with actionable Agile um, because it's a great plugin. I think Azure, Azure DevOps is where I've used it the most. Um, so it's a little bit of shout out to that as a plugin to Azure DevOps. Um, but uh, most tools will allow you to at least enable whip limits so that it'll make the column red or something like that. Um, but slight tool rant, I'll just leave it at that, that I tend to be very tool agnostic because I, I, I haven't been a huge fan of how tools are dictating our, our, our processes over the other way around. So hopefully that answers your questions, but directly for Trello, check the power up. Anything else to add there, Jose? So yeah, I mean, uh, it, it's an interesting one because I, I usually uh, I, I usually sometimes make a little bit of a joke that we talk about in the Agile Manifesto and we say, hey, you know, it's all about individual individual interactions over, over tools and processes, yeah? Or processes and tools. And usually the first two decisions that we make or companies make when they go agile is they choose a process, whatever framework method they choose, and they buy a tool. It's like, uh, um, so, and, and what you're saying they are told is that then you buy, the, you buy the tools and then we start getting limited by what the tool allows us to do or not. And that can, that can, be, that can be a challenge. Um, there are some great tools out there. And, and sometimes, look, I, I used to complain a lot about the tools that clients used to have and used to do it. We are, companies were going to be where they, are, where they are. And there are some tools that can be really, really useful and really powerful if you want to do, especially if you want to do Kanban. I've heard that you mentioned Kanban is that's probably one of the best tools where you can set up your, your workflows, your boards. You can look at what's happening at team level, what's happening beyond the team. You can put, use WIP limits or ways of limiting WIP. It doesn't have to be just WIP limits. So if you're looking at a tool which is fairly comprehensive in, in its support of Kanban, um, Kanbanize is one. Another one that probably will be very, 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 well, not probably, it's very, very, very good. It's uh, Linkit. Now it's Plan View. Call it's called Plan View. There are other there are other other tools there which are like again very Kanban Kanban like uh, Swift Kanban. Um, so there is a few options there. Tools that have been created with Kanban in mind from 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 their inception. Okay, but the most important thing for me about this, and I'm I'm with Todd as well, is like if I can get the data that it produces, if it helps teams make good decisions and collaborate and things like that, whatever the tool then is getting the data into a good analytics tool like Actionable Agile, where we can get the proper insights and help the team look at the look at what's happening, ask the right questions, um, make decisions, just basically just, you know, 
be more effective and more efficient, more predictable. Yeah, Jose, you said something there that just like like made me perk up when you said ask the right questions, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, isn't that what we're trying to do all, all together, right? So when we're when you look at um, uh, measurements in Kanban, when you think about something like doing a Monte Carlo simulation, um, from uh, like I just think about trying to trigger the right conversations at the right time earlier. Uh, uh, more so than later, right? So it, mm -hmm. it, enabling us to ask the right questions. So I, um, so long as the tools aren't detracting from doing that, um, it, uh, we're in good shape, right? Yeah, absolutely. Is that right, Tom? Did we did we give you enough of an answer, or would you like to to add something to to it? Uh, no, no. Thanks very much. Excellent. Okay. So uh, let me just quickly. I'm looking at something here. Um, I just lost questions. There's a few questions there. Um, uh, Tom, again, <laughs> you had again a good question. But we're talking about like getting more work done. What was the question exactly? Tom Calloway. Yeah. So, so this was kind of from the perspective of uh, Little's Law, and you know you've got delivery rates and you've got the whip limits uh, and the cycle time. Um, the team's capacity, uh, you know often defines like the individual capacity is kind of often defined the, the ultimate highest delivery rate. Um, and if there's inefficiency, you're probably below that delivery rate, the maximum delivery rate. So I just wondered how often when you see a team apply Kanban, not only do they reduce the cycle time, which is definitely expected directly as a result of uh, introducing whip limits, but you also see um, a higher delivery rate as well, rather than just keeping a constant delivery rate, but just with a lower cycle time. That was yeah. a really interesting conversation going on in one of the Slack channels today about this. <laughs> there was. Oh, I'm interested. Know, maybe, you know. maybe you can maybe you can backfill in that because like what first yeah. trigger what what first triggers me here is um, this notion of efficiency, right? Um, because I think that we oftentimes forget about effectiveness um, when we when we over concentrate on efficiency. So I think mm -hmm. any of those things could be true based off of the context of the situation and the people doing the work, right? Ultimately, we do want to be able to deliver faster, but you know, I always, I've been posing this question a lot and quite frankly, it's made, it, it, it'll shake executives a little bit. When I say, can you have everybody maximized, busy and working efficiently as possible and have, your, have an unhappy customer? And, the, and they're like, yeah, right? And so I'm not trying to detract from your question, Tom. It's just what triggered in my brain there is, is, um, uh, we, 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 we don't want to forget about the product side of this and think about the effectiveness of what we're doing. And in fact, um, that's part of the Kanban guide, right? Is that uh, there's three elements to pay attention to here. One is the effectiveness. I'm reading it, by the way. I don't, I don't have it memorized on that. I, my memory is bad. <laughs> but uh, to, to be effective, efficient, and, and, and then have some predictability in our workflows, right? So I'm just pulling out another element because I, I, I want to make sure I'm calling that out. So mm -hmm. um, yeah. with that saying, Jose, I'm interested in hearing what was happening in the channel, uh, the Slack yeah. channel, because I like, I like um, someone here, I haven't paid attention to it too much uh, of late. So, so if, I, if I had to, to, to where you were going, I'm going to the other one, um, is the, um, this thing about efficiency, uh, to me, is, is a, there's a very interesting thing, because when we talk about efficiency in most organizations, we are many times focusing on making what we're talking about is resource efficiency most of the time. It's about getting people busy, getting people utilized, all right? Um, I still see this all the time. If you're not busy, well, let's get more work. Let's give people this work. And the key change that we need to look is, to, is what needs to be busy is the work, not the worker. And we all know that, okay? But many companies still don't, don't, don't really um, feel it. Or well, they don't get it. Yeah, that what needs to be busy is the work. And um, when you when we have our our working environments and there are these this you know bits of work like you know epics, stories, projects, initiatives, whatever they are, and the vast majority of their lifetime is no one is doing anything, is waiting on a queue for someone to have the time to do it, or we are interrupting, waiting for approvals, getting waiting for a dependency that someone else is going to, all these things are like real, real tragedies, you know? And what we need to do is to get to get the work busy, the work, being the work busy, that means that it's going to get through its beginning to its end much faster, that end-to-end -end flow. And that's a fundamental thing. 
Um, what I think sometimes company get grow, going to the question Tom that you were saying, I I I think that when you look at the, the the core fundamental flow metrics that we have, you know, the amount of work in progress, the, the cycle time, the time it takes to to get things done, and the throughput or the delivery rate, we also that's going to be my cat making an, an appearance soon. Um, the 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 focus many times is about this idea of like give me more deliver more give me more delivery yeah however the most difficult one of all these metrics to to impact is the throughput it's really 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 difficult to increase throughput many times well actually it should be almost like the last thing that we should consider first of all is um if we try to deliver more in an inefficient process or an ineffective process what we are going to end up doing is um, most like, likely is um, delivering, um, uh, uh, amplifying our dysfunctions. So what we need, really need to focus on is like, first of all, is like brings some sense, some, um, some sense to the amount of work that we have. Make it reasonable, make it balanced. Yeah, that will likely, most likely, reduce our our delivery times. Yeah. And only when we have those, only when we have really nailed our process, our our ways of working, our our you know all the all the different interactions that we have, only then we can really really start looking at more throughput, more delivery, scaling, and things like that. And I think many times we we to, we try to go all the way to hey give me more, but what we end up doing is more dysfunctions rather than more delivery. I don't know whether that's a little bit. Um, tangential but that, that's that's a that's an important thing yeah i think that really adds to what uh, maru is saying here in chat too because if you think about that and jose mm -hmm. i think that uh we're kind of building on each other here with what we're saying but think about if, how you could temporarily increase that and with a reduction in quality pay the price for it in the end and what you're what you're mentioning there um we could be inadvertently interjecting future problems into our flow of work yeah by trying to concentrate on something like increased throughput when the reality is like, we're, 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 we're changing that for a short-term gain for a long-term loss, right? So to me, I think that there's a lot of stuff you can sprinkle in. The thing I really love about the Pro Kanban Guide, right, is, is that it is it, it really describes Kanban as a framework where you can add things like DevOps if you're based in that circumstance. You can add different elements to it if you're in a marketing um, condition. Um, and, and so like my mind always goes software, but I'm finding more and more with this whole agile conversation that it's not just software. It's not even remotely close to software anymore. I've seen this massive influx of people. Um, yeah, I know Kanban isn't a framework, but it's more generic in the way that it's described in the pro Kanban guide, right? We're not talking about super explicit practices that you have to implement, um, uh, so, so uh, now I've thrown off track, but thank you for calling that out. Okay. <laughs> Um, so mm -hmm. that's what I like about it. We can add these things like DevOps if they're if they're in the circumstance that we need them to be in. We can add other elements to it. You can use something like a user story, but it's not required, right? Um, so I'll, I'll leave it at that. Where are we going from here with uh, that question? But there is there is a there is a couple of questions, and probably there is no specific order here. But there were a couple of questions here the, about like different flavors of Kanban. Mm. So, you know, there is things like Pro Kanban, there is the um, David Anderson's Kanban method, there is Tame Flow, um, and so on. And, and especially then it's another connected question. That was uh, Maru, I think the question. And then the other one was uh, Demerson saying, oh, the Kanban University says that Kanban is not agile. It's an alternative to agile. So shall we talk about different flavors of agile and what, that, what, what do they perhaps mean or do? Sure. Yeah. Um, you want to go? So I, I, uh, I feel like Kanban is agile, right? Um, and so, you know, I'm going to preface this by saying that I, um, I am not well studied in the uh, Kanban University side of the house. I um, stumbled into Kanban. Uh, I've read a book prior to most of my Kanban experience prior to books and Research was on my own, uh, so I, I will admittedly tell you that I'm not well studied in that area. Um, so, uh, so as I was mentioning, as I found um, as I found some other elements to uh, uh, Kanban, like we were trying whip limits and things like that. That was through research. That was ten years ago. 
Then I met Daniel Vacante five years ago. <clears throat> and um, he's really helped to shape and improve me as a, as a Kanban professional. Um, the book costs 70 euros. Yeah, uh, he's got two great books. I, I don't know how much Daniel Vacante's books cost, but when will it be done? And Actionable Agile Metrics are two awesome books. Jose's got them right next to him. So yeah, um, and those are great references. So as far, I, I, I'm not here uh, to do a comparison between those two. Jose, I think you're probably better equipped to do that. Um, but yeah. I, yeah, go on. But, but we, we probably won't dive too deep into that. Are you? No, 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 no. Um, so, um, the, the, uh, so for a little bit of that context, I, I actually been, have, have been training Kanban since 2012. Um, for the first eight years, I was doing Kanban method training. And the last, the last year or so, I've been focusing more on the pro Kanban side. Um, they're all useful. Yeah, they're all very, in all of them, they have like a very, very, a lot of similarities. Okay. Um, if we look at it from the perspective of, of Pro Kanban, Pro Kanban, what, what Pro Kanban has done is something similar to what the, Kanban, uh, the Scrum Guide does. And it's gone into a like really, really essence of what's possible to have an effective implementation of Kanban and start using Kanban. Okay. Um, beyond that, you can add whatever you need and your context it finds useful um we will consider all those things as complementary practices fair enough yeah um so if you look at it from that perspective or that sort of like additive constructive perspective um the kanban method has a lot more uh, of a knowledge um pool around it it has more more content more components more elements things that from pro kanban they're optional well, Kanban method will say, hey, you know, you need to use things like class of service. We have all these principles. We have all these, you know, um, all these values. We have all these things. Um, but those are from pro Kanban, they are, they are complementary practices. From Kanban method, they are core elements. And that's about, that, that's about it. Um, um, I don't think we need, I don't think there needs to be more, more than that. Yeah. Um, in terms of like, you know, there is no, there is not necessarily any conflict on it. Um, if you have been in the Kanban method world, there will be things in Pro Kanban that might go and say like, really? So for example, Pro Kanban doesn't use the, the, the Kanban method principles. And, and the reason why they are not there, um, and I, I didn't write the guide, but I, I did help with like, you know, sort of like feedback loops about it, is that many of those principles that Kanban method has like start where you are now, they're not necessarily universal principles. They don't apply to every single context. So from the perspective of what is the minimum set of what Kanban could do, those, those principles that the method has are not universally applicable. Therefore they are not in. Does that make sense? Yeah, and I yeah. think that's, uh, Jose, with what you were mentioning there um, from the pro Kanban side, really context is king. And those practices yeah. are all really good to know and understand as are things such as DevOps and things like that. I think that's where I was going when I, uh, when, when I in in inadvertently used the word frame. I said it backwards, <laughs> word, right? Um, is that context is really king when it comes to the pro Kanban guide. And I think that's, uh, that's the thing that I, that I really like about it, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and I mean, things like team flow, for example, again, it's really, really strong flow principles and, and Kanban, mm -hmm. yeah, with a lot of influence from theory of constraints. Yeah. So it brings, it brings, a, it, 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 you can see almost the, the influence that the different authors will have. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, th those are just options that might be, they're good to have in your toolkit to go and say, okay, what may I, what other things may I need, may I need in my context? Yeah. And, and, and that's it. Um, is, is Kanban Agile? Uh, do you know, I sometimes feel that that is a bit of like, is that, is that, is that even really a useful conversation? But <laughs> let, let, let me just go, let, let me go. Does Kanban help teams and organizations have better agility? Yes. Yeah. Um, did Kanban, the different flavors of Kanban, start in the world of Agile? Well, most most of the originators will say, oh, no, we're really influenced by Lean. Yeah, we were influenced by, by the world of Lean and Toyota and so on. Yes, but 
we also had to adapt it to the world of complex work. And by the time all these things started to emerge, Agile was already there. So Agile influenced the, the, the um, beginning of Kanban. Like, like Agile was influenced by Lean. So th there is feedback loops here going on. These things are not happening in isolation. So is Kanban uh, Agile? I don't see how not. I don't see how we can be in today's world not doing knowledge work and complex work and not be aware or influenced by, by Agile. I just don't see how. And I, I, I always think of the words uncovering better ways, right? So originating yeah. back to the manifesto, which is, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it celebrates its uh, was a 20 year anniversary just a little bit ago. Um, and it, it is software centric, but I like to replace software with product, but we are uncovering better ways of developing software by doing it and helping others do it, right? Um, mm -hmm. You're doing that with Kanban. Yes. It's actually very powerful to do that with Kanban. Yeah. I, if something what I will say is that we, one thing about Kanban and, and when I'm doing training and coaching, I usually say is like the, the, the power of Kanban many times is its versatility because it's like, you know, th there is no specific answer. It's like, tell me what the problem is. Mm -hmm. Tell me what the context is. And then we, we will have, we can use Kanban principles and practices and so on to help us make things make sense of things you know we were talking about it before like um can, can, when kanban really really works it helps people ask better questions earlier mm -hmm. on yeah yeah you know if you're achieving that awesome yeah um so i don't know where i was going now i lost my my train of thought because i was well, I'm, 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 sca I'm scared not <laughs> to I'm, I'm scared not to be equipped to ask yeah. those questions yes Yes. Right. And Kanban Very really important. enables you to do that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I was saying, and that's the power of Kanban is that it's 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 it's, it's versatility. It's like tell me what the context is, and then we will we can build things around using Kanban metrics and practices and so on to help make things better. Yeah. To be to help us be more successful. The curse of Kanban is a versatility. Mm. Because there is no model. That, I mean, it's I I. I I don't think that you can just copy anything that you, someone else has done somewhere else and use it in your context and it will work. It, it won't. So maybe that's a danger. Have to, a, that's yeah? a danger, I think, with some other some other things out there is that mm -hmm. um, it's like this will here's here's one here's a picture that will solve all of your problems. Yeah. Right. And that's the problem. So did you put the first picture, you say like, hey, you know, um, but yeah. even with Kanban, in other, in other yeah. places, you're more <laughs> then, you're, then you're but just even... trying to plug the holes from, <laughs> from, exactly. from flooding, flooding the room. Yeah. But even with Kanban, you, 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 you have a team and say, hey, you know, this could be potentially how, you know, look at some examples of, of um, team level Kanban. Yeah. And then you ask people, okay, let's go and design your, why don't you start designing your own board and you start seeing exactly the same solutions that you're, you showed them it's like no no that was just to trigger your imagination not to copy and paste and you know centers of humans we 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 see these things we get anchor and we start copy. never ever ever copy someone else's kanban for your own context you have you have different problems you have different contexts and and that's that's part of the power of kanban is part of its cares that that you know there are no there are no answers yeah. And, you know, something that's been on my mind, uh, I've heard a, a phrase a lot recently is this notion of like recency bias. Right. And just and I think of recency biases and well, it's just worked for me in my last job or this worked for me with my last team or this worked for me in the last product development effort. Um, I have learned multiple times that that's a bad strategy. Um, I, I've learned I personally have learned that the hard way. Right. Yeah. And uh, so yeah. I wonder if it, it, if I wonder if that's relates. And I think we're just naturally inclined to think that way. And Jose, I'm trying to it's, buy you time to question search. Is that working? Is it working? It, it is working, actually. But that was a, that's an interesting. You just reminded me of something a few few well, before the pandemic, when we still used to travel and mm. see people in the flesh. I mean, God, you know, that's like 10 years ago. Um, um, I was I was I was uh, visiting a company that in Ireland, in Dublin that they have been really doing some really interesting things with Kanban. And it was like, you know, it was exciting. It was really, really exciting what they were start, the, the, what they were doing and the, what they were starting to achieve. Yeah. And um, not because it was Kanban, but it was what was happening to the company. CTO decides to go. New CTO arrives. Talk about recency oh. bias. And within two weeks, what happened? 
CTO goes and says, oh, I don't like any of this. I was very successful using, you know, method X, safe, <laughs> and <laughs> force the installation of safe on that organization. Mm -hmm. And that was really interesting because for me, it was like, who, at the moment in this organization, who is the one person that doesn't know the organization yet? Right. That's CTO. <laughs> That's CTO. Yeah, so yeah, recency bias is very, yeah, because it works somewhere else, it will not work. I mean, even my, you know, what we say, my, my track record of doing Kanban, new client, new environment, or new team, or whatever it is, all the previous history is just gives me a little bit of context and, you know, all uh -huh. of us gives us a little bit of, a, of more things in the tool set. You got to start from a scratch. You do. You really do. And you that's what, that's what to... makes it maddening and yes. also very thrilling. <laughs> yeah. And it requires patience, which is in the, in the current business context the world is difficult because, you know, you're there, we are all there and we're like, oh, you know, we need to start producing results. It's like, yeah, sometimes just observing what's going on might be the best the best thing you could do today in order to understand what's going on and then make the right help people make the right the, the thing the right changes or the right things so good um there was a question about apk um and uh so i'm guessing it's about um uh, what is it srini is srini here it's a question is the question about the exam isn't it i know what, what would be tough in the APK and how different is with PSK? Mm -hmm. All right. Any thoughts on that? Because Todd, you and I teach both courses. So what's what's what might be tough about APK and what's different or how similar is to PSK? So the, in the PSK, you know, we're talking about, uh, about uh, Kanban in, within the walls of Scrum and predominantly how uh, Kanban can help you um, from a uh, from from a within the walls of a sprint, we and there's an entire universe outside of that. But the P, there's only so much time in a in a in a, in a two or a three day course, uh, and so the the PSK is a blend of Scrum and and and, and Kanban. It does talk. I would say, what would you say, eighty percent Kanban, Jose? But it is really within the bounds of how you could use Kanban um, in in the walls of a sprint. Uh, whereas the P AP, PSK, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, PSK. Yeah. And yeah. now we talk about the pro Kanban APK. Uh, hardest part is 80 questions in 60 minutes. Yeah, but both of them, actually, both, I will say, Andre, and you could probably agree with me, both exams are hard. Yes. I, I would say um, I, 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 I found them both challenging and actually they're, I, I, I liked them a lot because I, no matter where you fall on the side of certifications, if to me it causes someone to pick up a book or reread the pro Kanban guide and things like that, I'm more inclined to try to find ways to learn. And I was challenged by both of those exams. So I, I find them to be equally, uh, and maybe we, Andre, we can come back and talk about that. But uh, the, the APK on the other ones, we're, we're, we're talking about Kanban, right? Uh, a lot of that course is centered around um, definition of workflow. Um, and, and, and so like uh, scrum PSK, a little bit, uh, Kanban within the walls of scrum, APK Kanban, right? Yeah. I don't know if you have any more specifics you, you, you think are worth adding, uh, Jose or Andre, you're a pro Kanban trainer as well. Yeah. So for, for me, the, the thing about, um, with, um, PSK, like professional scrum with Kanban is that if you are working in a context where you have a scrum teams, yeah, a scrum already comes with a whole range of things which are given or they're part of a scrum yeah. and they're compatible with Kanban. So Kanban, what you're doing with Kanban is you're bringing a set of additional practices um, that will, will work on top of, of your scrum. Yeah. Um, when I was looking at PSK for the first time, and, and I said, I mean, this was this was uh, what, two, three years ago when PSK was introduced. And I have been doing Kanban for many, many years. And I actually got really, really, really excited. And the thing that really excited me about what PSK was doing was that maybe maybe other people don't have this don't, don't have the same feeling, but for me, when you look at the Scrum Guide, we used to talk about self-organization, now we talk about self-management. But the guy is a little bit woolly about this. He's almost like self-organized, damn it. Yeah, just but go off and bit... self-organize. Yeah. Right? yeah, go off and self-organize. But <laughs> it, it many times kind of like 
there was no actionable guidance about how, what the self-organization actually looked like, mm -hmm. right? When you start thinking about like the things that Kanban will do in terms of like having a better description of how do we work here as a team to be successful, to be more reliable in our work, to be more, you know, to have a better work environment for us. It's a very humanistic way of looking at it as well. I mean, like Scrum will be. And those, you have all those metrics, which I always say the metrics are the best friends of a Scrum team. Because those metrics makes the team start thinking about how do what questions do we need to ask ourselves? How do we make better decisions? How do we become more uh, effective, efficient, predictable? Yeah. So you bring you bring that thing that Kanban brings into Scrum. And honestly, Kanban is the secret source of a, of a Scrum. It's it's a, it can be absolutely transformative in the Scrum. Things like the aging charts used in daily Scrums. I, I haven't. I have seen very little practices making a, a more of an impact in in Scrum teams. I couldn't. I could that that thing that you just said right there. It was <laughs> a an, an epic change to the way Scrum teams operate when we stop. First of all, it's Scrum Guide twenty twenty. We don't have the three questions anymore, right? Yes. <clears throat> so what everything that people that I've been telling people is start paying attention to work on a mage because yes. I I feel like. What happens here is it illuminates whether your team is a cooperating group of individuals or a collaborating group of individuals. Cooperating is a whole bunch of people that grab different things and go in different directions and hope they integrate at the end. Collaborating is that we are all in it, working together, trying to come out with a solution at the end of it, right? Or yeah. at some time during it. So I, I feel like so, all those things that you were just mentioning there, Jose, really that yeah. helps to illuminate those things and brings them to the surface in an objective yeah. way, not like oh, it really feels like this. Yeah. It's very objective in, in in what you're what you're doing. Exactly, and and that's the thing for me. If you if you're starting from a place where you have a Scrum or a framework like well, Scrum in particular, and you bring the power of command, it's, it's like honestly, it's like leveling up. You know, to to use a, a gaming term, yeah, it's like you you as a Scrum master or Scrum team and so on or developer, it's leveling up, yeah. What what came what APK does is says okay well fine if you don't start from the from the context of a Scrum then let's just focus about how Kanban will be applicable to whatever is your current context. Same thing, same practices, same metrics. We have more time to look at Kanban in depth in more, in more depth, but because there is no this this you know you don't have to do you you don't have the, the baseline of we are using a Scrum yeah. So there's a lot of similarity, but you know, if you if you are working in a, in, a, in an environment where Scrum is present, PSK is absolutely awesome. Yeah, if you don't start from Scrum and you are interested in Kanban or Flow or whatever, then look look at APK. I would actually say too, I think both of them could be applicable. They're very in similar situation. Yeah, both yeah, of them could yeah. be applicable. Cool. Um, anybody has done any of the courses? I mean, maybe you know you you might have your own opinion. It would be great if someone has done APK or PSK. I will would be great to hear your thoughts about those class those courses. Anyone? You are invited to unmute and, and share. We do have JT has had his hand up uh, for yeah, yes. Now we we'll, we we'll go to JT for a minute. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Hi. Actually, he's got tired. <laughs> Good evening. Hi, JT. Okay. Hmm. Um. Yeah, I did the course. Um, oh, golly gosh, I, I think I tried the exam four times. Love the material. Um, love the way it set out with Scrum and Kanban, but I just couldn't get there. It was 81%, 84%, um, mm -hmm. and I had to put it down. Not that I'm not going to go back to it, um, but it's, it really gives, it works really well together. Uh, I would recommend yeah. it's it's not easy. Yeah, no, it, it's a, it's a, in in the Scrum set of exams and certifications. I would you say that is probably. I mean, to, I, I haven't done all of them, so I mean, PSM three is epic. Um, so probably that's the most difficult one by far. But PSK uh, for for P, the PSK one, yeah, is is it's a difficult exam. It's not easy. Mm. It does require quite a bit of preparation. Yes. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't do the course, to be fair. Mm -hmm. I kind of studied because I did all the scrum org.inc and all that jazz. Um, mm -hmm. 
But I thought, oh, I'll, I'll be okay. But I think mm -hmm. maybe I'll just go on a course. So if I can give some advice, one, one thing that really has helped um, uh, that I think is that uh, uh, putting it into practice, right? Like I, I, I truly didn't understand what, uh, what and how to do Monte Carlo until I built my own Monte Carlo simulation in Excel. Maybe that's me. I'm a reverse engineer. I'm a coder, right? <laughs> and and I, I'm lucky enough to have a, a wife with a degree in math that could that could I could check it <laughs> and test and make sure that what I was doing was correct. Um, so I think that can help with the exams too. Just trying to put it into practice and, and things such as that. Yeah. Uh, one one thing that I would add as well. Um, obviously the exams. Um, you need to read the guide and normally um, mm -hmm. either the Chrome with Kanban guide or the Kanban guide. They're very similar, not entirely the same, obviously, because one assumes Scrum is present. Um, but usually both in the Scrum or in ProKanban.org, you will have additional reading material, which I think is very, very useful for things like the exam. They provide additional context, probably they elaborate things a little bit more. Yeah, and there might be good context for exam. But one invitation of anybody that is interested in doing either exam. If you go to the ProCamban Slack channel, there are lots of PSTs there that do PSK training. And obviously there is lots of PKTs there that do ProCamban training. So ask the community, the communities. Um, as I said, there has been very interesting conversations going on. Um, um, people asking questions, you know, how, how does it work? Yeah, I will use it. Thank you, I will get it. So, JT, did you have a question in particular or? Um, no, no, something else. Yeah. No? Hey, thank you. Good, 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 good. Um, okay. Uh, there, I, I had a question here and now I, I've lost it. Um, if you're interested, by the way, the video has been recorded. I'll put it, I'll share it in a minute, the link to the to the uh, YouTube playlist where, we, where you can find all the, typically all the Lineage of London um, meetup events, all the recordings. Um, I, I, I lost my track. Is there any question that any, anybody has a question while I'm looking for questions? Yeah, feel free. I know. To okay, no, I have, I have, I have a good question here. Um, Tom, um, Tom Calloway, uh, uh, is there a point, uh, a point of diminishing returns as you add more and more activities or columns to your board? That's a great question. Tom, do you want to elaborate a little bit on that? Uh, yeah, I guess I guess all I'd say is, um, you know, the larger the board, uh, perhaps the more unwieldy it would be. Uh, uh, maybe, you know, some tools might not uh, make it very uh, user friendly to read. Um, yes. But then again, if you if you have a team that, uh, as they think more deeply about their processes, they come up with more activities. I would think that could be helpful. So. But I also think I also think uh, what you're trying to accomplish with it too, because I just think of some teams that were so um, so stuck on upstream and downstream activities, right? <clears throat> that to create a little bit of transparency around that, we would find it interesting to potentially add them there. Um, I've done that before, and it's backfired on me a bit. <laughs> where, and then it's it's made either the upstream or downstream stream. <laughs> entity upset uh, because we're creating that transparency, but they also weren't doing anything about it. So um, to, to me, I guess context is king again, Tom. Um, I, I, I think I'm just thinking back into situations where I felt like they've gotten quite big and uh, really we came down to when are we trying to trigger conversations? What are we trying to trigger conversations about? And um, if it's lending itself to doing that. Uh, there's, there's also, uh, sometimes, the, as, the, as the saying goes, addition by subtraction. Um, I really believe in the quote, uh, to simplify yields of richer result often. Um, but just because you add something doesn't mean that you can't later remove it, right? Um, if I add on this, I mean, I, like, like we said before, this is going to be very, very contextual, okay? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I will say like that it, there is going to be what is far too little I'm far too much, okay? What is too little for me? Like uh, to do doing done, which is like a typical word that we see in many places. Um, that look, that might be okay in, in, in certain contexts, yeah? But the, what, what does doing mean? I mean, to do is we have all this work that we need to do and done is, hey, we have delivery. It's quite 
important to try to say, you know, say just doing is like, well, I'm doing stuff. The key that helps a team self-organize, self-manage will be, yeah, but how? What, what does the work have to go through? It's workflow, no role flow. It's not about mapping each role in the team. Yeah, It's about what are the different stages that each piece of work needs to go through so that we can so that we can win, so that we can deliver this request, this request, this demand, and turn them into deliveries, good deliveries. Yeah. So to do doing that probably is far too undescriptive. The other end is when you try to like actually try to map every single potential activity and you start creating a massive sequence of concatenated events. Um, a few years ago, working with um, or visiting a uh, basically the treasury in the UK, um, they, they, they built a, what I would call a mega Kanban board, mega board. They had 50 columns and something like 20 swim lanes, horizontal lanes. And they, they, they were trying to figure out why they didn't get flow. And it was like, because you over you over specified your workflow. That you That's you eliminated ep, yeah you eliminated every opportunity of collaboration everything now here is a handover mm -hmm. so what they, unfortunately what they did is was they modeled the handovers rather than say generically where are we we are in the discovery phase good there might be parallel activity here we are in the implementation phase we are in the validation phase um, I typically will say that, you know, somewhere around five to 10 columns, probably as much as you probably need. And again, context is king. I don't know your context, so I'm, I don't know if that's the right advice. But, you know, too few, it's not descriptive enough. Too many, it's too, it's too inflexible. Hmm. Yeah. There is one. I, I, so I, I was trying to let somebody in and I accidentally muted Jose. <laughs> it was an accident, I swear. <laughs> there is one thing that I, uh, I will add to this and it's something that we many times don't realize. Every time that a team decides to add a column, they are doing something probably unaware of what they're actually trying to do. What happens when, especially if we, well, if I, if I tell you something, then you, you know the answer. Um, if we are, I'm gonna give you the answer. If we have column-based weak limits, what, what happens when a team argues for a new column is effectively that new column will come with a new whip. So it's a, maybe, a, an intentional or underhanded way of increasing the amount of work that the team has, which will have consequences. The more whip will will most likely reduce or slow down our delivery time, and it might also affect our throughput. So adding more whip, it's it's you know adding a new column every time. Say like why? I think going back to what I was saying, why are we adding this column? What mm -hmm. what problem is it going to help us resolve? And what potentially consequences could it have to our ability to manage flow by adding that column? Consequences could be positive or negative. Yeah, yeah? I think it's that's interesting, flow. Jose, because mm -hmm. like, um, are, are we are we are we doing it because we we just want a safety net and whip, right? Or are we doing mm -hmm. it because it's giving us an opportunity where we think there might be something that is getting in our way that we could illuminate and trigger a conversation with, right? Um, yes. Yes. Is that all right? Does that, any any anyone wants to add some something to that? I would like to add. <laughs> okay. Come on, Louisa. Uh, yes. Hi. Uh, so I am using uh, about seven flows. And the reason is this one, again, each and every team or company has a different uh, styles, right? Depending on whatever the business uh, would like to resolve. So in my particular case, the business stakeholders were frustrated by the fact that they would see a uh, user story moving from the to-do into, uh, you know, the whip, a work in progress, and was sitting in there without 
uh, them having an idea what is actually sitting. It is with the business analyst who is trying desperately to add more information or, uh, uh, you know, to resolve that user story. Is it actually with a developer or is it with the QA? So in order to eliminate that, we are using, for example, a JIRA to track this, uh, this user stories and uh, the activity and actually in, um, uh, in the development. So then it's very easy once you set up all these seven flows to show exactly where the uh, the, actually the user story is, if it's in the development or if it's already uh, in the QA or has been deployed for the business to actually test it and to approve it. So uh, uh, using the flows, but I agree with you about seven flows is really enough, whatever you need. Don't go for 20 flows makes no sense because the whole purpose is to monitor the work in progress. So what happens if you have already about two or three tickets open and you want to open the fourth one in work in progress, you know that you are going to run in trouble and you are uh, not going to, uh, to basically to finish it. So that's why we are using one of the um, I don't know how, how popular it is in uh, UK, but in uh, US or Canada, we are using very much uh, the, how should I say, the learnings from Dr. Jeff Sutherland. So Dr. Jeff Sutherland has published two, uh, several years ago, about 10 years ago, two absolutely wonderful uh, white papers. And one of them is actually how you limit the uh, actually the work in progress and that is by doing swarming that's one of the seven uh, activities that you can do to uh, actually regulate the the flow so swarming meaning that you get all the team to actually to push and to work to finish that uh, basically um, uh, user story instead of continuously opening so many that they are not going to finish, right? So there are different practices, again, depending on whatever the company or whatever business you want to serve. But I think that this one, I tested it, I worked with, uh, with the swarming and the other uh, seven uh, actually practices. I'll send you, if you don't mind, uh, uh, either to Jose or to Todd, I'll send you the links to actually the two um, uh, white papers. There are only three, four pages. And if you try those items, you'll see how fast you are actually moving. Not only that you're moving through all these the to-do work in progress and done, but you are also allowing the business uh, to know where you are in your uh, actually process in uh, delivering the uh, the ticket or the uh, user story. Um, um, I, I think I will. I, I've seen already some people. You have those links. Put them on chat. But otherwise, like share it with them, ah. with us, and then we'll, we'll share it on the meetup group as well. Absolutely, okay? I'll put or them in the, in the chat. In... Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, because they uh, are it, from it... Uh, Jeff Sutherland's uh, actually on his uh, website. Uh, on yeah, Scrum yeah. mm -hmm. and we put them on on the Slack as well. Um, the interesting, for example, about about swarming is, is an interesting one. The connection to whip limits. Um, how many times in organizations we we are talking to people and say, hey, you know, we want we want people to collaborate more, and we want mm -hmm. people to mentor each other and to help each other and all these things. We want we want collaborative environments and multidisciplinary environments and all those things. But then what we do is we load people with so much work that the last thing they can actually even think about is collaborating or helping others or mentoring others. Like we want to, if we want to emerge the opportunity of all those things to happen, people working together, pairing, swarming or mobbing, whatever it is, one really, really, really effective way of doing it is like have less work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Have less work in progress because by having less work in progress, yes. it will help. It will encourage people to say, well, okay, how because there is just no, there is no, there is no work for just me. So let's start pairing. Let's start working. Let's start collaborating. Let's start doing all these good things that we talk about. I never had time to do. 
So, you know, when people start talking about like um, how serious they are about like collaboration, swarming, mobbing, pairing, mentoring, all those things, it's like, okay, show me your work in progress. Oh, no, right. actually, not even the work in progress. Show me. Be, you're right. It has to be only yeah. two or three uh, user stories, right? I would stop you. Basically, you do not take the fourth one or the fifth one. Yeah. You stop but them from taking it until you finish it. Context is keen. Some in some yeah. environments will be two, sometimes will three, sometimes will be seven. I I don't know, but but the thing is about that is if people are saying we have too much work to you know they have too much work to actually do all these good things that we want to do, there is too much work in progress. If people are saying hey, I could do more, it's too little work in progress. So you know find find the balance, but you know, find mm -hmm. things that help encourage. I mean, this is the thing. Find find things that help encourage and emerge the right behaviors that we are aiming for. So, and I'm sensing a theme with yeah. all of that tonight, right, Jose? That's a lot of what we talk, talked about tonight. And to kind of highlight is that that notion of do you have a a a, a, um, a cooperating group of people or a collaborating team? That those are two yes. very different things. Unfortunately, a lot of what we see is a um, a cooperating group of people. Um, yeah. Let's. Uh, the, these 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 practices can really help you turn that into a collaborating team. Uh, because they illuminate the fact that you're yeah. you're cooperating right now, and that has a connection again. Like we are all the time talking about, like how can we get you know more self-managing, self-organizing teams? You know things like this, things like you know work in progress limits or, or limiting work in progress. It doesn't mm -hmm. have to be just a work in progress. Things like that can help emerge all those things. Um, I saw a couple. I'm mindful that we are up the time and so we we should be wrapping up soon a um, couple of comments that we saw there about all these things about adding whip limits and uh, adding more columns and so um i saw a good point uh from temi uh, and you're saying like um by when you add the more columns the, the thing that you could be looking at is like okay, well you know uh, how, how could you ensure that your whip overall i guess is not increasing so you might rebalance things, and that's good. And um, the the thing I will say with this is like whenever you do a change to a board or a working practice to a work environment, run it as an experiment. Yeah, how do you know? You know, measure the consequences, measure the results, positive or negative. So try to run an experiment and say, you know, how would you know that this change is helping? How would it, how would you know when this change is not helping? It's not working. Um, which also goes to the question I have there, like the DP was talking about, um, you know, adding new columns could add more clarity um, to the flow. And yeah, absolutely. Could, let's say if, if, if it helps you, do it. Yeah. Sometimes you do add a new column, for example, like I've seen sometimes people adding code review columns. And, and it might be something that even temporarily to build the habit of it might be a useful thing to do. But you might only do it temporarily or maybe it's there forever. I don't know. Depends on your context. So all that stuff. Um, someone is recommending uh, Ian Carroll. He is an absolutely source of wisdom. Um, so Ian Carroll, based in the UK, um, if you find his writing, his blog posts, and all the stuff, he is an absolute source of wisdom for you know board design, Kanban, and so on. So that's great. Uh, anything else? Did miss anything? I don't know. Yes. But yeah, I hope more, everybody more is doing columns. awesome and staying safe. How about that? Everybody's doing yes. awesome and staying safe. Yes. No, I think we, we've um, done the hour. I hope you enjoyed it. The recording will be in um, published in the YouTube channel. I just put the link again. That's where we have a playlist of all the events. So you you will see other previous sessions like as the trainer, as the common trainer, and other sessions that we've done. Um, just want to say thank you. Stay safe. Stay healthy. Um, <laughs> And I hope, like, you know, something in the future we can start, like, seeing people in the flesh. That'd be great. Um, Todd, it's been great to have you. Thank you for, for your time today. Great hanging out with you as usual, Jose. Yeah, uh, it's great. It's very enjoyable. Thank you for all your contributions and all your questions. And hopefully see you in the Slack channel. Um, see you in, in another one of our sessions. And, you know, um, I'll say, yeah, stay safe. Keep improving. Bye-bye. Keep improving. <laughs> Keep things better. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thank you, everyone.